Hi, boys and girls. This is Pastor Josh coming at you from my office for this week's Kids for Truth lesson. Thanks for tuning in and staying on track with our lessons. Today, we're going to wrap up our last truths for God's plan for the future. In fact, we're, today we're going to uh, wrap up our last uh, truths of our book. And we're going to get a brand new, We are most of you already got a brand new book. We're going to start a brand new book next week. But we're in God's plan for the future. Ooh, uh, a lot of things we've learned from this study. A lot of things that maybe we didn't know were going to happen. We talked about the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ and the tribulation. We talked about um, Satan being bound for a thousand years and then Jesus Christ setting up his millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign. Uh, we talked about the great white throne judgment where all the unbelievers are going to get judged. And today I want to talk about how God will create a new heaven and a new earth. Question number nine says this, where will believers spend eternity? Most of you probably know this answer already. Where will believers spend eternity? Where will we be forever? The answer, believers will spend eternity on a new earth. Now, most of you probably were going to say heaven. So the new heaven is actually the new earth that God's going to create. So we're going to say goodbye to the old earth. That's the first thing. Because of the effects of sin on the old earth, the earth that we live on now, God's going to destroy this earth. We're going to say goodbye to it. Now that might make you sad a little bit. Maybe there's some things that you might miss on this old earth. Maybe your house, maybe your favorite park, maybe your school. But remember, there's no more people that are unbelievers. All the people, the only people that are left on the earth are believers. And will we just be believers in God and no more sin? All the unbelievers have already been judged at the great white throne of judgment and are in the lake of fire. What, so, so there might be some things that we might miss on this earth, but there might be some things that we won't miss on this earth. Like for me, I'm not going to miss the tornadoes and the hurricanes and the tsunamis, um, the nat natural disasters of this earth. I'm not, I'm not going to miss those, the things that cause destruction. So the first thing we're going to do on this new heaven and the new earth is say goodbye to the old earth. Something we're going to be able to enjoy on this new heaven and new earth is actually the fact that we're going to actually be able to live with God. Yeah, you heard me right. We're actually going to be able to live with God on the new earth in heaven. He's actually going to be with us. I mean, up to this point, if we want to talk to God, we couldn't go visit him. Hey, we couldn't call him on the phone. Um, he doesn't come and hang out with us. I mean, he is, God is always with us. But what I mean is we can't see him or touch him. Whereas on the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, we'll actually be able to live with him, talk with him. God will create a brand new earth for a brand new city called the new Jerusalem. Both the new earth and the new Jerusalem will be forever untouched by sin. And there will be no more vast oceans. This is pretty cool, ready? The verse, the verse we're going to look at says there will be no more oceans, vast oceans, like we have on the earth right now. Believers will have much more land to travel around and enjoy. And the Bible tells us some details about the new earth and the new Jerusalem, and all of them are exciting to read about. So let's look at, look at a little bit. Can you get your Bibles ready? The reference is Revelation 21 one. Can you say it? Revelation 21, one. Draw swords and charge. See if you can beat me. Revelation, last book of the Bible. Revelation 21, one. Revelation 21, one. Might even be the last couple pages of your Bible. I found it. Did you get it yet? Revelation 21, one. We're actually going to look at verses one, two, and three. Revelation 21, one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So there you go. The new heaven, the new earth, the old heaven and the old earth were passed away, and the sea was no more. So back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve 
I got to talk to God with God and walk with him and talked about probably nature and creation and just about God. And that and we're going to be able to do that too on the new earth. God will walk and talk with people again. This will be so neat. I can't wait. I really look forward to be able to just talk with God face to face. What would you, what do you think you would talk with God about? Maybe something you'd want to ask him or something you'd want to tell him. Well, I know I'd, I'd want to tell him that I loved him. Let's look at verse number three. Revelation 21, three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. That's really neat. Look at verse four. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So not only are we going to be, be able to enjoy living with God, walking and talking with him, but we'll also um, be able to enjoy not having any more pain or sorrow, no more tears, no more crying. Heaven's going to be a perfect place, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Let's talk about this new Jerusalem, living in a big, beautiful city. So not only are we going to be able to live with God, but also live in this big, beautiful city called the New Jerusalem. Do you want to know some things about it? Well, one thing is its size. It's a huge city. The Bible tells us that the New Jerusalem will be about 1,400 miles wide. That's how wide it's going to be, 1,400 miles, not feet, miles. It'll be 1,400 miles long, and it'll be 1,400 miles high. This is a huge city where we'll live. To put it in a little bit better perspective here, the New Jerusalem, if it was on our present earth, it would be... It would cover about half of the United States. That's huge. You think about, you think about the largest city in the United States, New York City. I mean, that's that's New York City is a big city. If you've ever been there before, just buildings, tall buildings everywhere. Millions of people live there. But it's it's really a small city compared to a city that covers half of the United States. I mean, that's huge. Millions and millions of people will be able to live there. So the new earth that God's going to create will probably be bigger than our current earth. So the size of the new Jerusalem will fit in the size of the new earth. So not only will the new Jerusalem be big, it will also be made of beautiful stones, gold, jewels, pearls. The foundation of the new earth, of the, of the, new, the new Jerusalem, will have 12 layers each one made from a different type of jewel. Wow. And then there'll be 12 gates that surround the New Jerusalem. Each of those gates will be made from a giant pearl. Nothing on earth, even the most elaborate, beautiful houses, mansions, could compare to the New Jerusalem. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be great. Also, something about the new earth. The new earth will have no sun to light it. Nope, won't need a sun. Why? Well, because Jesus will be our light. His glory will shine throughout the whole earth forever. And having no night won't bother believers because we won't need sleep because we'll have glorified bodies. We'll never have to take naps or get tired. That's pretty neat, huh? And then one last thing I want to tell you about the new earth. The new earth will have trees and rivers, specifically a special tree that will span a river that flows from God's throne. And then each month, the tree will produce a special different kind of fruit that we'll get to enjoy. Can you imagine what that fruit tastes like? Oh, it's going to be so great. 
I can't wait. Are you looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth? I hope that you are. Maybe you're not, though. Or maybe you're not sure that you're going to be able to enjoy this new heaven and new earth. Maybe you're not sure that you're saved. Well, one thing that you can make sure of is that you're saved. You can know without any doubt that you're on your way to heaven. And the way you can know is through faith in Jesus. Not by good works that we do, but by repenting of your sins and putting your faith in Jesus that he died for you. If you haven't done this, I encourage you to do this today so that you can know that you'll be with God, that you'll live with him forever in this big, beautiful city. All right, that's lesson number nine. Now we're going to move into lesson number 10. Last lesson here, okay? Last one of the book. We're going to move into a brand new book. I've got it right here, actually. Most of you have already gotten your new books. <clears throat> I gave them, handed them out at church, but if you haven't gotten yours yet, that's fine. I can either mail it to you or uh, give it to you when we start back on February 3rd, which is next Wednesday. One week from today, we'll start meeting back in person again at the church. Um, and we're going to start a brand new book. And first page, the new theme we're going to talk about is God's Word, the Bible. God's Word, the Bible. So that's where we can start studying from, memorizing from, and saying truths from starting this next Wednesday. So our lesson number 10, <clears throat> question number 10 says, what should believers do as they wait for Christ's return? What do you think, knowing all this stuff about the future, what do you think that we should be doing as Christians until Jesus Christ comes back at the rapture? Well, there's three things that we as Christians should do. Three things that should be summing up our life right now. Three verbs that should describe who we are and what we're doing. You know, if a lot of people have three things, a list of three things that they love to do or describe their life. If you're, if you're a, a big gamer, if you like video games, it would be eat, sleep, and then game. Eat, sleep, game. Eat, sleep, game. If you like to surf, it would be surf, then sleep, and then surf some more. If you're a student and you like to study, it would be study, then sleep, and then maybe goof around a little bit. If you really like to eat, anyone out there like to eat? Yeah. It would be eat, eat again, and then eat some more. But there's three words that should be describing our Christian life right now. Really what our life should be all about until Jesus comes back. And those three words are worship, work, and warn. What are the three? Worship, work, and warn. And that's what Lesson 10 is about. It's talking about what these three things are that we should be doing as Christians if you're saved, if you're a believer, if you know Jesus is coming back for you one day, then you should be worshiping, working, and warning. Let's look at a verse about this. Draw swords. The reference, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Say it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Draw swords and charge. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. New Testament, almost at the very end. Not quite where we were in Revelation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. 6. First Thessalonians. I found it. Did you get it yet? First Thessalonians 5, 6. It says this. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. You know, some Christians, after they get saved, they just want to sit around and do nothing, uh, twiddle their thumbs, and just wait for Jesus to come back. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is about worshiping God, glorifying him with all we say and do, working for him, serving him, and warning others that Jesus is coming. So let's talk about worshiping. Why should believers worship the Lord as they wait for Christ's return? Well, the biggest reason is because he's worthy of our worship. He deserves our worship. On Sundays, when we come to church, it shouldn't be about 
us and what we can get out of the service. And if we feel good when we leave, that's not what church is about, what we can get. Church is about what we can give to God, worship. We worship God um, in our song, which I hope that when you sing at church or maybe when you sing at home or even in your bedroom when you sing, that you're, you worship God, you're focusing on him. So we worship God when we sing, but we also worship God when we do this. When we listen. Being a good listener when your pastor is preaching or when, you're te- when your parents are teaching you about God or your teacher at school. You can actually worship God by listening well. Yeah. And then another way we worship God is when we give. When we give our money. Or even our time. But yeah, when you give your offering at church, which I hope that you do, you give back to God as he's given to you. That's an act of worship. Our whole life should be an act of worship, really. So how can we worship God on this earth? Well, by talking about how great he is, by reading the Bible to find out more about him, and by singing songs really in all that you do and say. And that's why what it comes down to, whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you're doing, do all for the glory of God. Our life and everything we do, even the small things like eating and drinking, can be done as an act of worship. So that's the first thing we should be doing as Christians. Until Jesus comes back, we should be worshiping God. That's right. Number two, we should be working, worshiping and working for God. Does that mean we need to like go get a job and make money? No. When we talk about working for God, it's talking about really just serving him with your life. Doing what you do for God. Finding ways, seeking, looking for ways to serve God, to serve others. So why should believers work for God until Jesus returns? Well, the first one is because you love him. Because you You want to serve him. You love him so much, you just want to serve him your whole life. One of the big reasons why I committed to serving God my whole life as a pastor is because Jesus served me. Jesus Jesus gave up his life for me. The least I could do is serve him with my life. And then a third reason that we should be working for God is because we'll receive rewards. We talked about this. At the the judgment seat of Christ, all Christians will receive rewards rewards for the good good works they've done done out of a a heart of pure love for god motivated by by love for god so we'll receive those rewards and then be able to lay those rewards back at jesus's feet as an act of worship so that should be another reason why we should be working right now serving god in order to give our rewards back to him and then our third and final w our third and final thing that we should be doing not just worshiping and not just working but warning. We should be warning other people, unbelievers, the unsaved. Warn them. Tell them. Yes, heaven is coming, but there's also bad things that are coming. Remember the very, very bad days? Lots and lots and lots and lots of bad days of the tribulation and the judgment upon sin and the earth and unbelievers. Last week we talked about, or two weeks ago we talked about the great white throne judgment where all believers are going to be judged for their sin, and then cast in the lake of fire if their name was not found in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we need to warn people about this. Tell them, hey, listen, judgment's coming for sin. Judgment's coming against unbelievers. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Maybe there's someone that you know that you need to tell about Jesus and warn them. Maybe it's a cousin. Maybe it's an unsaved relative. Uh, brother, sister, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Maybe it's a friend down the street. Maybe it's someone at school. Who do you know that's not saved that you need to warn? One way that I like to warn people is just by telling them about my best friend. I'll go up to them and say, hey, have I ever told you about my best friend? And they might look at you and say, well, I thought I was your best friend. No, I'm talking about Jesus. He's my best friend. Can I tell you what Jesus did for me? He died. He died so that I can live. He gave up his life for me. And guess what? 
He even died for you. He gave up he gave up his life for you too. He can be your best friend too. So using using Jesus as your best friend as as a way to tell people about Jesus, about uh, warning them about how they need to be saved. So it's easy to focus on the good things that are coming on this new heaven and this new earth and and heaven. But we also need to be focusing on warning unbelievers and telling them about Jesus. Don't just sit around and twiddle your thumbs and wait. Wait for Jesus. Come on, Jesus, any day. No, we should be faithfully worshiping God until he returns. We should be faithfully working for God, serving him, looking for ways that you can serve and get involved, maybe even in your church. I know you might not be able to serve a lot as a child, but one day as you become older and teen, as a teen and an adult, serving God. And then the last one is warning. Worship, work, and warn. What are the three? Worship, work, and warn. And I hope that you'll do these three things until the day that you die or until Jesus comes back. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed our study of God's plan for the future. We learned a lot of neat things, things that we could even be doing today and things that we have to look forward to. And so next week, February 3rd, we'll start meeting in person at Back at the Church, and we'll start our brand new books. And our, our the first truth, the first lesson is God's Word, the Bible. I look forward to that and studying God's Word with you and the importance of it in our life. But until then, hope you have a great rest of your week. And serve God faithfully, boys and girls. I want you to know that I love you and that God loves you too. Have a great day. Bye-bye.